Hello, and welcome to The John Ark Show. Today, we are going to interview actor Johnny Russo. Uh, Johnny is uh, a, both an actor and a writer, and uh, he has been in The Godfather, Super Mario Brothers, Rush Hour 2, The Godfather Part 2, Seabiscuit, and many other great movies. He's also the author of a new book called Hollywood Godfather, My Life in Movies and the Mob. This man has had an extraordinary life. Before we begin, I want to encourage you to subscribe, like, comment, and follow us. Also, we're going to have a lot of great celebrity interviews coming up, so I encourage you to click on the notification bell so you can be notified every time we upload a new episode. I'd also like to tell you uh, about a service called HollywoodIsCalling.com. It's a great service that allows you to purchase live phone calls from more than 100 celebrities. You can purchase a live 15-second call for $19.95 or a live 30-second call for $29.95. Um, so give it a try. You can buy a call for yourself or as a gift for somebody you know. HollywoodIsCalling.com. Now, let's say hello to Johnny Russo. Hello, Johnny. Welcome to the John Ark Show. How are you today, sir? I'm so good. It's amazing. I, I uh, This past Saturday, I... Celebrated my 78th birthday. I can't believe it. Nice. And I feel amazing. So nice. nice. I'm up. That's important. I'm up and healthy. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So Johnny, you've had an extraordinary life. One of the many reasons it's so interesting is that you have managed to simultaneously exist in a variety of different worlds. You've, na you've successfully navigated your way through the entertainment world, the world of business, the world of organized crime, and perhaps most interestingly, the world of politics. What do you think opened more doors for you in your life? Was it being made famous by the Godfather movie or was it your relationship with mob boss Frank Costello? I think Costello, because early on I had the privilege of meeting so many people you know, and in being part of the uh, four years of getting, getting Senator John F. Kennedy nominated and elected, I met everybody in the world that I would never normally meet. I'd be isolated in New York City. But I was traveling throughout the country, meeting every mob boss, every union executive, every mafia guy, every senator that was important enough for, this, for them to get to back him in the Democratic Party. And I was just a kid. Hmm. So, you know, I was at the inauguration about 10 rows from him being sworn in and I'm 18 years old. Everybody's saying, who's this guy? <laughs> now, I think Costello was my main guy. Yeah. So when you were a child, you spent five years in a hospital being treated for polio. Five years to a child is like 10 years to an adult. Um, years. Yeah, yeah. So I have this theory and this theory is that when you experience prolonged isolation, whether it's in a hospital, a prison, or perhaps even an orphanage like Marilyn Monroe, one of two things is going to happen to you. Either it destroys you or it makes you tough as steel. What effect did that have on your life? Well, a tough as steel is what I am, thank God. But yeah. that, I mean, you know, I'm, I'm, we were all going through a pandemic now. And unfortunately for me, at the age of six and a half, I was on August 7th, 1949, I was put in Bellevue and I didn't know what quarantine meant. And I was locked in there for five years, as you mentioned, and part of Jonas Salt's experiment. And I was so confused as any kid would be at that age, because I was already an altar boy going to church every day with my grandmother. And I was saying, why is God doing this to me? And then they had a vaccine as we do now and they split 20 beds in half, 10 got it, 10 didn't. And I didn't get that vaccine. And I'm saying, what are you know, <laughs> you know, there was some kind of malarkey on me or something. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, those 10 kids, it elevated their virus and they all died in a matter of like 72 hours. Mm -hmm. I was blessed again. Yeah, that, it's almost like the universe is intervening on your behalf. It, it seems that way. I mean, you know, when you, Go through chronologically, my life is like insane. Even, you know, as uh, we'll get into it, I'm sure the characters that I've met and survived, you know, the, the John Gotti's, the Pablo Escobar's, everybody. 
<laughs> and I'm still here. It's, it's funny. You, you know, in life, whenever I've seen the universe intervene in people's lives repeatedly like that, usually that means that what's ahead of you is far more important and you're being prepared for that than what's been happening in the past. And well, it seems great. like... I hope you're the, right. Yeah, I, I, I get that feeling. Um, tell us about how you got the role in the Godfather movie. You played Carlo, and, and you were involved in helping to get that movie made as well. Well, that's the only reason I did it. I mean, egotistically, I always wanted to be an actor. I was already making money in my 20s. I mean, well, I mean, when I was 21, I bought a $3 million boat. I bought a 148-foot Riva Cash. So I didn't need the movie business, but I wanted to be a movie star. <laughs> And uh, knowing the mob as well as I did by then, I knew it was all about money. So I knew Joe Colombo, who happened to be picketing the, you know, the FBI office and all that. And this was in 69 and 70. And the book just came out. So I flew to New York. I was in, in Las Vegas at the time. And I met with him. And I said, Joe, you're missing a great opportunity to make a lot of money. He said, how's that? I said, well, you know, and he just hired a young attorney who's still around, and I know him well yet, Barry Slotnick. And Barry Slotnick was the attorney for the Anti-Defamation League for the Italians. And he was a nice Jewish boy. I said, listen, why don't I set up a meeting at Paramount, and we'll sit down, and what you don't like, we'll straighten out. So he said to me, you can do that? I said, I don't know. You have to give me the permission. I can't go talk on your behalf. So he looked at Barry. He said, what do you think, Barry? He said, it's worth the shot. So he said, but how do we make money? I said, well, if you agree to let them shoot the movie, give them the locations, the cooperation of the neighborhoods and the unions, I'll get you the world premieres in every major city the night before in the big theaters. He said, well, we make money. I said, well, you can get $150, $200 a ticket to see the world premiere to Godfather. It was Lions 24-7 watching it already. I mean, not, you know, knew what would happen. So with that said, he said, you think you could do it? I said, let me go see. So I walked from Madison Avenue up to uh, Columbus Circle, which was the Gulf and Western building, mm -hmm. which happens to be now Trump International Hotel. And I went up to the 33rd floor. I was sitting downstairs and I'm watching everybody line up. Uh, Bobby Evans, Stanley Jaffe, Al Ruddy. Because they all fled to New York because of what was going on. And they already had so much money invested in this. And Paramount was about to pull the plug. Because they needed the winter and the spring and the summer. They thought if we shot, started shooting in February, they can get it all in one take. So with that said, I said, listen, I saw Ruddy. I said, you guys have a lot of problems. I can straighten out. He said, we have no problems. I said, listen, I just left Joe Colombo. He said, you just left who? I said, Joe Colombo. He wants me to set a meeting for him. So I did. The next morning at nine o'clock, we're all there. And I told Joe, I said, when you come, bring some heavyweights. They just read the book, The Godfather. Bring like a Luco Brazzi which he happened to know. Lenny Montana was collecting money for them. <laughs> That's how Lenny got the, the movie bought also. There were so many real guys, especially at my wedding. But uh, so we made the deal and they were ready to you know, get up and leave. And I said, Joe, what about me? So he raises his hand like the Lord and everybody sits down again. <laughs> He's waiting to do for my boy. So Ruddy said, oh, we're going to give a part. I said, excuse me. I didn't want a part. I had somebody read me the book. I want a part like Michael, Sonny, or Carlo. So this is something your audience may hear for the first time. They said, well, Michael's already been cast by James Kahn. And I said, what about Sonny? They said, Sonny's Carmine Caridi. He had a big hit on Broadway called the man from La Mancha. They thought they needed a big guy. I said, what about Carlo then? They said, we didn't cast Carlo yet. So I said to Colombo, I said, Joe, I want to play Carlo. So he looked at them, he says, he's playing Carlo. And they said, all right, that's how I got in the film business. <laughs> 
It's amazing. You know, earlier you mentioned that you got $3 million at the age of 21. Most 21-year-olds will go completely insane if somebody dropped $3 million into their lap. How did you keep, I'm assuming you kept a level head with, with oh, yeah. that money. Yeah. So how, what do you attribute that to? Is that, that, that level-headedness, that reasonableness at such a young age not to go crazy with $3 million? Well, you know what it is? I, I, I was from the streets when I got out of the hospital. I was selling ballpoint pens on the street corner of, you know, again, I don't know. I went from downtown realizing these people didn't have money to buy the pens either. So I took the N train and I got off at 59th Street and 5th Avenue. I crossed the street right from the station, still there, at the Sherry Netherlands Hotel. And I'm seeing all these people dressed in clothes I've never saw before. Limousines pulling up and down. So I made that my spot. And every day, Frank Costello would come by, never took a pen, gave me words of advice, always gave me a hug and touched my left shoulder. And from that point on, we became friends. And then one day he asked me what my name is. And I told him, and he said, who's Angelo Russo to you? I said, Angelo Russo is my great uncle in Sicily. He said, oh yeah, when'd you see him last? I said, when did I see him last? I said, if you knew him, you I never saw him. He said, oh, yeah, why is that? I said, well, they hung him in Sicily in 1947 when they were trying to clean up Colocos and Ostra. So he tells the guy that was with him every day, who I thought was his friend, was his bodyguard. He says, take that cigar box from the kid, because I have my cigar box with my money and my pens in it, because I was still a gift in my left hand. I said, you ain't taking my cigar box. He took out two $100 bills. I never saw a dollar bill in my life. He said, now I bought your cigar box. He said, you know where the world open story is? I said, of course, I know where it is. He said, be there tomorrow morning at 11 o'clock. I said, okay. I was there at 10 o'clock. I wanted to make sure the guy don't sneak out on me. I thought he lived there. Now, only to find out, Blackie came, who was his bodyguard, and he says, come, Mr. C wants to see you. So I sit down. And he let me know that my great uncle was responsible for his family coming to, to America. Carlo Gambino at 17 was already made in the Gambino family out of Sicily and, and Charlie Luciano and Vito Genovese. They all came because they wanted them to take over the Moderano gang in New York and create the five families. So that's how I got my ticket to life. Hmm. And until Costello died in 72, I was with the man every day and made a lot of money, hmm. fortunately. So I believe that Marilyn Monroe, actress Sharon Tate, and singer Joan Jett were amongst the most beautiful women to ever walk the earth. I met Joan years ago, and she was so beautiful that looking at her was like staring into the sun. I, it, just an amazing, amazing face. Now, you say in your book that you had a relationship with Marilyn Monroe. Describe the time you walked into the room for the first time and saw that incredible face in person. Well, I, I had to go to continuation school. I was, I was on the streets doing messages with Costello, and a true novice pulled me over and walking. He said, where, why aren't you in school? I said, who are you? Because he had a brown uniform. I knew he wasn't a cop. I said, I don't go to school. I had like 5,000 in cash in my pocket, going to two chores to give it to Costello. He said, well, you got to go to school. I said, well, okay. So he writes me a ticket. So I kept the ticket in my hand. I walk in, and Costello and, and two Shaw, Jackie Gleason, they're all there. And they said, how'd you get a ticket? You're walking too fast. And he looks at the ticket, and it was for a truant officer. And he said, how old are you? I said, I'm 15 and a half, because this was in the summer. He said, well, you got to go to school. I'll take care of this. I said, I don't want to go to school. He said, don't worry about it. So the next day I seen at the, at the Waldorf, he said, I enrolled you in Wilford Academy, which was a hairdressing school, on my route above Lindy's. He said, just go there at 9 o'clock in the morning, check in until you, till your birthday, and then don't go no more. So the first day I go, I see like 20, 30 beautiful little girls. I said, I'll come there every day for a couple of hours, and I go see him. So the, I was going to the school, and one morning, Mark Sinclair and Kenneth came, and they were top hairdressers. In fact, 
Uh, Kenneth was already Senator John F. Kennedy, Jackie's hairdresser. And they were working at Lily Dache, and they needed shampoo boys. And they picked me. I was always well-groomed, and I was a germ freak, and still am. And uh, I went there. And the fourth head of hair, they told me to go to shampoo station number one. There were actually booths, private rooms, because of the clothes when the woman wore. You know, they'd put them, hang them up, give them a locker, and there was a maid there and all that. I walk in the room, and there's Marilyn Monroe facing the, you know, we all know the configuration of a shampoo basin. She's looking up at the ceiling, and I don't know how long I was looking at her, and she said, is there anybody here? I said, excuse me, I'm sorry. Because what your audience don't know is that I saw some like it hot maybe 20 times already. Because I used to go to the New York Paramount late at night. And it was on Broadway while I was there. And I watched it. I mean, I could don't want to say anything foul, but I was 15 and a half years of age. This girl got me crazy. Now she's laying in my shampoo basin. So I go through all the you know, accolade, you know the movements they said, uh, get the water temperature, put it on her wrist, let her approve it. And I'm shampooing her hair, and she's moaning as if we were having you know, a relationship. Mm-hmm. And now you understand, anybody that's had seen Some Like It Hot, she sings, I want to make love to you in a very sheer dress that would arouse anybody. It would wake the dead. So now I'm, I'm fantasizing and I'm saying to myself, how am I going to dry? I have to towel dry this lady's hair and walk her to the station now because I was embarrassed. You use your imagination. Sure. So now I'm walking behind her trying to manipulate myself so nobody sees me. And uh, then she started requesting me. And then one day, Costello tells me we have a guest staying at the hotel. I'm going to go. He like to go deep sea fishing. He's checking on them over the weekend. That's great. He don't go up before noon. So Saturday, I go up there, and I knock on the door, and she opens the door with a Terry Cloth robe on. And she said, Johnny, what are you doing here? I said, well, Mr. C told me to look in on you. I didn't know it was you. He said, oh, come on in. I just ordered room service. Now, I don't know what room service is. She had all these trays and carts with food. So have some breakfast. I said, I already ate breakfast. Thank you. She said, well, sit down. I said, no, I should go downstairs. Mr. C will get awfully annoyed knowing that I'm in the room. She said, I'll never tell him. Sit down. She want a glass of champagne? I said, I can't have champagne. But she gives me a glass of champagne. Then we started talking. And then she said, I'm going to take a bath. I said, great. I'll go downstairs. Everybody knows me in the hotel. Just call the front desk and tell them you want the kid. Because they never used my name. In fact, I think people didn't realize my name until I made the movie The Godfather. Everybody around the world knew me as the kid, Costello's kid. Mm-hmm. So with that said, she said, no, come in, come in, brush out my hair for me. Well, I've done that numerous times already at the salon. So she lowers her robe, keeping herself covered. But I'm still, you know, a, a young guy. And I'm saying, wait a minute, I'm in a suite. At the Waldorf Astoria of Marilyn Monroe. Who's going to believe me? And so I'm brushing out of the air. And then she gets up and she takes me by the hand. And she says, get in the tub with me. I say, you crazy. I'm going to get killed. And she drops her robe and gets in the tub. Well, I, I finally got in the tub. Me being a gentleman and knowing your audience, it's all types of people. I got in the tub on Saturday afternoon. And I left on Monday morning. <laughs> That's all I can say. <laughs> you know what I think when I hear that story? It's a great, great story. I think how hard must it have been for you to go on from that point and start dating mere mortals again after you have been with Marilyn Monroe? Was it hard or did you, you just know, I never that? Did. You know, it was so funny because uh, soon after that, I got a, an amazing gift my 18th birthday from Costello. And he gave me hat check rooms which I'm saying, what do I want these for? So he gave me the Latin Quarter, um, Tut Shores, which we were always at, and the Copacabana. And I had to hire four girls for each one. So I, I always liked mature women. I like Sophia Lauren, those kind of people. 
So that's the type of images I was hiring. In fact, my first son, who's now 58, his mother worked for me, who was 20 years old than me. She was 38. Today, she's 98 years old. And my son said, Dad, how did you go with this lady? I had to dig up pictures to show. So to answer your question, I never went with men mortals. I went with women that, you know, very, you know, voluptuous women. And, and I didn't know what hat check rooms were, but anybody that lives in, in a cold area from November to February, March, the cloak rooms where they hung up their coats and hats. And then the girls doubled as cigarette girls in the club. So I was making a thousand, two thousand a night. And I amassed a lot of money because I had no, I still have no vices. I don't take drugs or gamble or anything. I learned from all the ones that were losing money around us. But was, Mar was Marilyn as sweet and feminine and, and uh, in real life as she was on the screen? Was she much more intelligent than depicted on the screen? What was your perception of her? My perception of her was we had a lot in common. And we learned that the first weekend, because as you pointed out, me being in Bellevue for five years, she was in an orphanage in the Valley of California. And we had a similar story. She told me a story. She used to look out and see the water tower of Warner Brothers and said, someday I'm going to be at that studio. And similar to my story, I finally got the window bed in the hospital. You had to wait somebody perish and move me up. And once I got that, I was from the neighborhood. All I saw was six story buildings downtown. Now I'm looking at the world of a story on 34th street because I was on 30th and I'm looking at it. And I said, someday I'm going to be uptown. I'm going to mean something. And that's how her and I were like two wounded kids that just wanted a genuine hug. And that's how that all started with me. And I was with her the last four years. And she was the most gentle person. And a lot of people took, it, took advantage of it. I mean, I don't know like Marlon Brando, Sinatra, all of Tony Curtis when he did Lepke. And, you know, because he did something like it hot. I asked him about it. And he said, well, you, you, well, you know Marilyn? I said, yeah, I got to know her. And... And we, we, we did that movie, it was three, three months we were on that together. Then he finally he gave me a question that only if you were with her, you would know, because she has a, a specific scar on us, a body. And Marlon Brando did the same thing years later when we did The Godfather. <laughs> but the woman, to me, was not a sex symbol. And, you know, at that time, I was a very good looking guy myself. But I just wanted somebody that was going to understand me to go out with some young girl chewing gum and smacking her lips. That's not where my head was at already. Because, you know, I, I got an education early on, working for Costello since I'm 12. You know, and I, handling the money and then get, getting involved with the, the politics of it all. And then they created what's called the syndicate. And I moved on, out of the five families in New York and started to work for people like Maya Lansky and Mo Dalitz and you know, the, uh, the Chicago outfit and got more into the union part of it and, and the, the big business of it. But, uh, do you, do you so, think she really loved the famous men or, or the men that she married and had long relationships with? Or were most of those relationships simply engaged in to advance her career by her? No, she, you know, she didn't want to advance her career. I mean, if you know her well, she ran to New York to get away from the Xanax because all they were doing was given to these sex parts. And she came here to study and she studied with everybody. I mean, Stella Adler, you name them, she was with them. She wanted to become a legitimate movie actor. And all the relationships she had, like with Sinatra and Brando, she felt all she could give was her body. She had nothing to offer. She had such a low esteem of herself, but she really wanted our fans and people to know that she's a, a true thespian which is hard to digest, especially in Hollywood, they're selling her one way. And unfortunately, I feel bad because, you know, the last weekend we spent together was three days before they had her killed. And she never got to do what she really wanted to do. 
Yeah, I heard that she lived in Sinatra's guest house at one time. Was that true? Oh, yeah. yeah. She lived around with a lot of people, and, and they all loved her. But even Sinatra took advantage of her sexually. So did Marlon Brando, Tony Curtis, all of them. I mean, I, 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 I was introduced to her sexually, but we were more friends. You know, she'd come out with me in, in the nighttime in a disguise. How do you walk around New York City with Marilyn Monroe? She'd have a brown wig on a trench coat. We'd meet at the subway bar and go to Gino's on Lexington Avenue, have a bowl of spaghetti on Sunday night. She was able to live a normal life around me. And, you know, everybody respected me already by that time, even though I was a young guy. But they knew I was around Costello. And I think that was the whole thing with her. You know, we'd walk the Brooklyn Bridge and sit on the other side just so she could look at the city. I and mean, we, we had so many great, great memories. And, and they, they weren't the sexual memories. They were of just her being a human being and who she really was. Hmm. So there are a lot of theories about how Marilyn died, but you have a fascinating story about how it worked. I have the truth. Yeah, could you tell us? <laughs> That's not a story. Yeah. No, I mean, she, she was brought to Cal Neva on that last weekend of July. And I was there just to be the eyes and ears for the people I were working for. And Sam Giacano, who was the underboss, everybody thought he was the boss of Chicago, but Mr. Ocado was always the boss. Tony Batch, they called him. And, but he was the street boss. And they were there because most people don't know, Joe Kennedy made a deal with Frank Costello, who were partners during Prohibition. They, they amassed millions of dollars together. And the deal he made with the mob and the syndicate was if you get my son elected, we will invade Cuba if he gets elected, and you'll get all your casinos back. So that, that was the great message, and everybody wanted it. But the unfortunate thing, once he became president, the mistake he made, he elected his brother Robert as attorney general, and everybody tried to talk him out of it. In fact, major people called even his father and said, you got to stop this. Because John didn't realize Robert was the youngest brother, the, the mama's boy, who didn't like anything his father represented, didn't like his mob friends, or even his brother's friends now, who got him elected. And he convinced John, not even to see Sinatra anymore. And I was there when Sinatra was renovating his house for that whole weekend. He spent hundreds of thousands of dollars. But, you know, Robert was the guy. And they were trying to set him up one more time. Because another thing your audience don't know, John Kennedy supposedly told Marilyn, once I become president, I'll leave Jackie and marry you. That's how naive she was. So Robert was supposed to get her away from him, and she, he, he did. But what your audience don't know, he impregnated her. We didn't know that. We found that out that weekend. We were in Cal Neva because when Sinatra tried to propose that we want to put, put Robert in, in a, you know, a, a situation with you in a room in the nude and whatever, and so they could have pictures to blackmail them, like they did Jay Edgar Hoover. They had pictures of Jay Edgar Hoover cross-dressing, and that's how they always denounced that there was even a mob until Bobby got involved. And then, you know, then everything else came out, Keith Alba Commission, and uh, I mean, so many, uh, Joe Balache, so many guys turned on the mob. But um, she started screaming, because, and she let Sinatra know that she just aborted Bobby's kid. And she's going to go to the press. I've had it with the Kennedys. And we all knew as soon as she said that, she's dead. And uh, Robert arranged for her to be killed. Hmm. So one of the themes of the third Godfather movie uh, was the concept of using the Vatican to launder money for criminal organizations. Now, in real life, money laundering has played a huge role in your life and the world of organized crime. Can you tell us about how you helped the Shah of Iran move millions of dollars uh, out of the country? <laughs> That's a funny story. That, you know, I just did that as a favor. I mean, I made, like, I think, $16 million out of it. But uh, we were very good friends. 
with General Mudaba. General Mudaba's daughters, uh, Pavin June, and uh, was married to my, my doctor, Theodore Jacobs. Talk about how small the world is. And so we went over to Tehran and just loved everything. In fact, we were, we were responsible for bringing Gagouche, who was the female Barbara Streisand, playing the Copacabana over there, We're talking about full circle. And with that said, we didn't know what was going on with the government. We heard about the Khomeini and all that. So the general called and said, can you come over and help us? We heard that you could uh, transport money. And I said, of course. So I came over with my friend, Nick Nitty, Frank Nitty's kid out of Chicago, who we got very friendly with because of the money we were moving out of Vegas through the Vatican. And uh, we got over there and they told us what they wanted to do. And we, we found out where all their money was all over the country, the world. I said, well, do this. We're going to go charter a plane. It was Nick's idea. We did a lot of business with Alitalia at that time. So we, we took an Alitalia plane, small plane, 727. And we went down to, because we needed the tanks. And we went down to Sicily and put six guys together. We come back. And while we were gone, we told them to order all their money, which would take 72 hours or more to get to Tehran. Put it all in the Tehran banks. And, and the Khomeini had spies on everything, and they thought they were idiots saying, oh, look at this. They're bringing all their money. <laughs> we don't have to go get it. And we had a military movement on a, a given day at 2 o'clock in the afternoon. We were going to take down the six banks in an hour and a half with military guys, our guys that we brought up. And we had all these polo equipment bags that are huge duffel bags. And we moved uh, 68 million in an hour and a half. And our plane was the last plane to go leave Tehran. And if we didn't have an Italian plane, they would have shot it down because the half tracks were racing to the airport. I was the last car because Nick was in the first car. I was in the last uh, SUV, but all military trucks. But the thing was, I knew I could never get to the plane. We already had wheels up at four o'clock and the, 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 the plane was already at the end of the runway, which we had this all staged. So we were just throwing bags into the luggage department and getting on the plane and ready to take off. I just, I mean, I just got on the plane as the door was coming up and we got off. The, unless we were never left, they would have shot us down. Hmm. But we were laughing the next day because we were flying back from uh, Sicily and we went to Rome and got a plane to Chicago. And the headlines were that the Khomeini has the fortune of the, of the Shah. And we already had it. it was in the Vatican already. <laughs> now, when you do a job like that, do you do it for a fee or a percentage? Percentage. percentage. Interesting. By the way, that story in and of itself is worthy of a motion picture. And it's much more interesting than Ocean's 11, 12, and 13 all combined. That's a really oh, gosh, interesting yeah, story. Yeah, yeah. It's, uh, you know, we had a, the, uh, the book, uh, we didn't even mention the book. The book we're talking about is Hollywood Godfather, My Life and the Movie and the Mob. Mm -hmm. And fortunately, I just made a huge deal. They wanted to make a motion picture out of it. And then when they saw the content of it, and I, I caught the eye of Nick Vallelongo, who won the Oscar for Green Book in 2018, Best Picture, Best Screenplay. Him and uh, Colin Wilson of Avatar and all those fames, they came to me, and I'm telling your audience the first to hear it. We, we closed the deal just the past few days that Colin Wilson is the showrunner, and Nick Vallelongo is directing and wrote the first pilot and we'll be doing others, but he's also a producer with Jules Nasser and Frank Nasser. And uh, we're doing a 10 episode movie that we own. We've got a privately financed $29 million. And uh, a guy called Jack Ma has been involved. Media set, Bertolsconi, 
We did nothing in America. So again, because of my connections in Italy and all that, we raised $29 million independently, and we own the whole thing. You know, if you don't mind me asking, how long does it take you to put together a deal like that? Is that three phone calls? Is that three months of phone calls? How long does it take you to put together a deal like that? It's about three months, I would say. But that's fast. Because, I mean, when, when you talk about Bobby De Niro buying the Irishman, he bought it in 2004. And when I read it, I know Frank Sheehan. I said, Bobby, there's no lies. Are you kidding me? I said, hold it. The guy said he supplied the guns for the Kennedy assassination. I was there. We didn't need him to supply guns. He had nothing to do with it. <laughs> I mean, the guy was, he, he credited himself with so many hits that he never did. But Bobby made the movie. And I think the result of it, as we all know now, hindsight, you know, that was a, a ridiculous story, major cast, and it was too long. Marty wanted to make it, you know, a three and a half or four hour movie. I forgot what it was, but it bombed. Hmm. So I'm happy that, you know, we're doing what we're doing. We're keeping creative control, which a studio would never do. And we're going to cast it with unknowns and just put major stars in the cameo roles. You know, it's interesting you should mention that because I really do believe that it's easier to get people to watch a 10 part miniseries like perhaps Narcos than it is to get them to sit down and watch a three or four hour movie. Much easier. Well, I mean, you know what's good about it too, what I found myself, you could turn it on when you want. Exactly. You know? Like, you know, you and I have our, our shows, my podcast is on, and there's a menu. This I have 93 hours up now. It's more convenient. I don't think people today, and I hate to say this, because I think movie theaters could be obsolete. Yeah. Nobody wants to go. Yeah. It's, so... It, is it true that in real life, the Vatican, is the Vatican still being used frequently for money laundering or is that a thing of the past? No, it's not a thing of the past. I, I'm a legitimate guy. You know, I'm, I'm, that's the other thing most people didn't know. When I, when I started successfully being and doing what I was doing, I got bonded by Lloyds of London. I'm a bonafide courier. I mean, I, I moved money. I made, I, I moved money in, in, in Switzerland for arms that I did with Anand Khashoggi. And uh, I can't tell you who the purchaser was, but I showed up and the guy couldn't believe it. And when I saw him, which is a funny line to me, because when most people meet me, they said, aren't you Carlo from The Godfather? <laughs> you know, they, don't, they don't realize this is really my business. Acting is like my golf game, which has worked out well because I've done 46 films that made money. And I made money with them also. But... Uh, no, so I mean, I made my business a legitimate business. And the Vatican Bank, most people don't know, there's only one bank of the Banca de Roma in the United States. And they created that. And the Banca de Roma is the head fiduciary for the Vatican. So they're, they're, they're doing like any other bank would do. Right. They take a number and, and it's a legitimate business. I mean, it started, which... They said, and I've had 23 federal indictments. They said I moved $800 million out of that, out of Vegas. <laughs> and the only reason I waited this long, you know, that had to be a statute of limitations. So it's, they're, they're done. <laughs> Every time they bring it up, I say, well, where is it? Can you tell me where it is? <laughs> you know, you had a really famous fight scene with James Caan in The Godfather. Oh, um yeah. And you said that he actually broke your ribs. Um, why did he do that? Did he get carried away or was there something else going on? No, there was a whole thing. Jimmy, really, when Jimmy got that role, he actually thought he was Sonny Corleone. He thought he got made. Mm -hmm. And he had good friends. I mean, Junior Persico and all those guys. Ali Boy, he knows all those guys. But he got to know them from this role. And he did something that, thank God, I was with uh, Tommy Bellotti. And uh, your audience may know his name because he was shot down in front of Sparks. He was the underboss of Paul Castellano when he took over the Gambino family, which wasn't a long career. But we were at the bar in Jilly's, which we always hung out with Sinatra and all of us were there all the time on West 52nd Street. And I was at the bar with an underboss called Boozy DiCicco. Boozy DiCicco was with the Gambino family. 
So Jimmy comes from the back where the piano bar was. We were in the front of the choir, piano at the, at the bar lounge. And he comes out and he says, Johnny, Junior's in the back. He used to call him a junior. His name was Carmine Persico. They said, Junior's in the back and he wants to see you. He's there with his daughter. Come meet her. So Tommy fortunately heard that. And so did Boozy hear that. I said, excuse me, I'll go say hello to Junior. And they said, give, give him our regards. So I go back there. So I'm with Tommy and, and Boozy at the bar. We hug, we kiss, the normal thing. And I look over and I said, Junior, your daughter is gorgeous. Now, I know Junior a long time. He was the under boss of the Colombo family. And he, they were responsible for getting me the part in the movie. So, you know, well, I know him. And I, his face to squats. And they used to call him the snake. His nickname was the snake. You do not play a game with this man. I saw his face and I said, uh oh, I got set up. So before going back to the bar, I went down to the men's room and two of Junior's guys followed me down the men's room. So I'm, I'm standing at the urinal and one of his guys gets behind me. I said, listen, I'll be, I'll be done in a minute. And the other guy is blocking the door. And just as I look over, the guy at the door goes flying in Tommy Bellotti, he's like a, a fire hydrant, hits the door. The guy goes slamming. Tommy grabs him by the back of his head and smashes his skull right on the bathroom sink. I mean, this guy was out. Now, the guy that's standing behind me, he's now, what are you going to do? He's, well, this punk and, and, and embarrassed Junior by calling this girl his daughter. Tommy smacks him. He's, he's not a punk. He's my friend. And he knocks him right out. Now, uh, Boozy's standing at the door because he heard, you know, he came down. So the only guy that can talk to Junior, because Junior's a made guy, and so is Boozy. So we walk up. Jimmy Kahn thought he saw a ghost because he thought these guys were going to beat me up. But he hated me because he had the part, as I told your audience, as Michael. All the shifting around they did he got the smaller part. He got Sonny. Sonny gets killed. He's out. Michael's in every part. He wanted it. So he thought I was instrumental in that. So he thought maybe he gets me beat up. They, get, they take me out and put somebody else in. They, they only shot a couple of scenes. So Junior goes in the kitchen with Boozy. And next they call for Jimmy. As soon as Jimmy goes in, they hear, pa, pa. I thought Boozy hit him. Junior hit him. So now we go in and he says, Jimmy, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to teach you the lesson about the mob. He says, this guy now owns you. He says, what are you talking about? He says, what you did tonight, I gave you the boozy. You're with the Gambinos now. And Tommy Bly says, I'm going to take him out. I said, how are you going to take him out? He says, start a movie. Let's wait till he's done. <laughs> See, but there, there again, anybody else in that circumstance who used the wrong word, like daughter, could have ended up in a dumpster. But oh, yet, yeah. the universe somehow intervenes on your behalf once again. I know. If, very, I was, very, if, if I wasn't there with Tommy and Boozy, I would have been in the dumpster. <laughs> yeah. I would have found me something wanted. Yeah, yeah. It's really interesting. If you step back and look at the big picture of, you know, of people's lives, it's very interesting, these patterns, how they repeat. Um, you also said that at one time you partied with President Clinton and that some women have actually left their husbands for him. Uh, was he just that charming or was it his uh, celebrity and his power? What was it? You know, I, I, Howard Stern, first time I did Howard, I just got back with 9-11. I was with Clinton. We were hired uh, over there to do a, a fundraiser, and we were guests of the, the, these people. And we were staying at the uh, presidential suite in Double Bay, Australia, and we were on this guy's yacht, and we were partying. We were there four or five days. I never knew Bill Clinton. I, I mean, I knew him as the president. But why I said that, Howard Stern said, who was the most charismatic man you ever hung out with? Was it Sinatra, Brando? I said, well, I'm going to tell you, you ain't going to believe it. it was Bill Clinton. Bill Clinton would walk into a room. I don't know what women saw in him, maybe the power of him being the president. But when I say women lived their husbands for them, I've seen it. I mean, I've seen, we had a yacht 
that we'd pull into a restaurant or something. We'd have four or five extra people that just wanted to take a ride with us. And we partied. I mean, obviously, I, Bobby, his top security guy, I still know. And uh, when we would leave a place, his detail would take him out. And then Bobby would call me back and say, Johnny, the girl in the green dress, the girl in the pink dress, we're sending the car back. Take him back to the suite. He'd pick out people before he left that he wanted. If there were with boyfriends or anything, and I'd just say, go over to Mr. You know, would you like to come to the presidential suite for drinks? See you. They say goodnight to their whole party. I don't know if it was the, even their father they were leaving. I never saw that before in my life. Hmm. You know, a, a lot of people out there in our audience will probably never get to experience 10% of the fun that you must have had in your life at these parties and elsewhere. Can you describe one of the wildest parties that you've ever been to? I actually created it. I, I, I was engaged to Liza Minnelli, if you can believe that. It's so funny. And we were in Dionne Warwick's house, which everybody thought I was with Dionne Warwick. I was her business manager for 15 years. I got to like her, but she was totally insane. So she bought a house on the Sahara Golf Course. And they used to do that a lot. The stars didn't want to stay in a hotel room. And then the hotel would lease that house from them and give it to the other stars. So Liza was staying in that house, all performing at the Riviera Hotel. And Liza and I had a, a liking for strange reasons. I don't know how many people know this, but Liza is bisexual. And we fell in love with a lot of the same women. So we had the cast of Bear Touch of Vegas, who was a lounge act at the Stardust, <laughs> come to have a late dinner, four o'clock in the morning. It was going to be a contest. Who makes the best fettuccine? Liza or I do? And we marked all the plates. Nobody knew in the kitchen. Liza went shopping with her driver from the Riviera. I went shopping with my driver because the supermarkets were open 24 hours. And we made a couple of pounds each of, of fettuccine Alfredo. So I got my friend, Nick Nitty, who was my partner. We had mobsters, show people, everybody. It was a fun night. And we have this dinner. And whatever, there was two dishes. And if you said, I like this dish, you'd hold it up. So I won. My plate had G's. Hard had an L underneath it. So Liza is sitting at the end of the table. It was pretty much like the table I'm sitting at with 16 people. And uh, she makes a snowball. Now, anybody in your audience who knows, fettuccine Alfredo, when it sits, it gets really sticky. She makes a, what would be a snowball and throws it at me. And I duck. We started a snowball fight and destroyed that whole house. <laughs> and Dion, who hates me today, knows these stories now. She had flock and foil, ridiculous wallpaper, and the chandeliers. The whole house was destroyed, <laughs> but Fettuccini stuck to it. <laughs> and that to me was the, the most fun I ever had at a house party, dinner party. And we were covered with it, which was nuts. But that's a classic. By the way, did you ever meet Meyer Lansky? And what was your perception of him if you did? I love Meyer. Meyer, my, Meyer was the one. Of, Frank Costello introduced me to go down the Lincoln Road. I was like a young kid. And he's going to meet this guy. And I, I always had a new. Frank, when I used to leave the uh, Waldorf, if he had something that's important, he'd put it in like the, the Wall Street Journal. Not so people are not seeing me leave, you know, with envelopes and all that. So they had a car take me right out to LaGuardia and go down to Miami and the car there picked me up, took me to Lincoln Road. And they told me to sit on this bench. And here comes this little old man with a little white poodle. And he sat down next to me. I didn't know this was the guy I was gonna meet. And I'm sitting there, and he said, he looks at me, are you the kid? I said, excuse me? He said, are you the kid? That's how he talks. I love this guy. And I said, yeah, who are you? 
He said, well, I'm Mr. Lansky. I'm partners with Mr. C. And you'll be seeing a lot of me. And I saw a lot of this guy. He, what a mentor. I mean, this guy, I've had such great mentors. But Maya, even when I went to Vegas, because his man, basically nobody knows this guy's name even, Mo Dalitz. Mo Dalitz was the boss of Las Vegas. Forget about Tony Spallatro and all the stories you hear. You didn't get anything done without Mo Dalitz, and that was Maya's man, and nobody touched this guy. Nobody. That's why they ran, the syndicate ran Vegas for years until Howard Hughes came in and brought in the FBI and the CIA. But uh, I love Maya. I, I'm told, I mean, I was with him for years and years and years. What was Meyer's genius? Everybody respected him so much. Was it organizational? Was it innovation? Was it- He's a mathematical great? genius. He could remember numbers. And he was very organizational and well-respected throughout the world. I mean, I, I, did my, I did a favor for a friend of mine. I can mention his name. His name is Al Malnick. He's still alive. And his son, Sharif, they own probably the best restaurant and still do in, in Miami called The Forge. Well, Sharif was being bar mitzvahed. And uh, Maya said to me, uh, because Frank was performing at the Fountain Blue, he said, Johnny, escort Frank over to the bar mitzvah. I said, okay, he knows he's going, yeah. So now I get a page, I'm at the Fountain Blue Hotel waiting for Sinatra, and it's Maya. It's Johnny, where's Frank? I said, I'm waiting for him. He said, go up and get him. I said, where are you? He said, I'm at Alvin's house. We're all waiting. So I go upstairs. <laughs> and I knock on the door. He had a security guard. And he said, he's not answering the door. So I knock on the door again. I said, Frank, I got to get you. I, you got to come. And nobody's moving. And I'm hearing somebody, a female's voice, right at the door. And it was Mia Farrow. She was blocking the door. So it was a double door. Not that I'm a strong guy. So I hit the center of the door. She goes flying. Frank comes out of the bedroom. So what's going on? I said, Frank, I just got a call from Maya. You got to get over to Alvin's house. And he looks at her. You told me they called it off. I said, Frank, they don't call off Bob Mitzvahs. <laughs> he said, give me 10 minutes. And I took him in. When I walked in, Maya said, leave it up to Johnny. Leave it up to Johnny. He kept, he get it. <laughs> but uh, Maya was a genius, man, and respected. I was, I was in Cuba a couple of times with him. But uh, in fact, his grandson is trying to open up the Nacional. And he said to me, Johnny, I know you have a license, and this could be great. I said, hold it. <laughs> I'm 78 years old. You think I don't want to open? I don't even want to open my refrigerator. I got enough going on. Leave me alone. <laughs> but, so uh, you talk about meeting Pablo Escobar uh, after his people tortured you for three days for killing one of his assassins. When you met him face to face, what was your perception of the man? You know, I, I mean, I want to I want to clarify this for your audience. What happened is his guy came into my restaurant called State Street, which was a famous you know, eatery and casino in Vegas. And we didn't know who he was. He was a guest of Caesar's Palace. We had a lot of house guests like that because we served gourmet food till six in the morning when most of the hotels, all their gourmet rooms closed at midnight because of the unions. So my idea was to do this, which brought me a lot of big players because my casino was there and they'd eat and go play. Well, this guy comes in. That was a usual routine you know, somebody coming in giving a black chips, $100 bills to people, which is interesting. I just had this conversation. We all know Steve Sharippa mm -hmm. from, uh, from The Sopranos and now Blue Bloods. Mm -hmm. Steve Sharippa was going to UNLV. He was my doorman at the time. So I'm at, I perched in my corner of the bar. I had a raised bar looking down at the dining room and wherever. And I said to Steve, I said, Steve, who's the guy? He said, I don't know who sees his guest. I said, how did he rate it? He said, five stars. I mean, we could blow him away. So the guy sat down. We sent a bottle of Cristal, a bottle of Louis the 13th, two ounces of caviar. He was already in for 1800. He was going to sign the check anyway. 
The next thing we know, he breaks the Cristal model and stabs the girl in the face. Literally stabbed her. So I called Steve. I said, Steve, get to table seven. He said, I'm not going over there, boss. That guy's nuts. I said, Steve, that's why I hired you. You know, we all know the size of Steve. So I go over there, and I didn't know if the guy was with anybody. We had problems before with some people. And I'd rather you go. So I walked over. I said, listen, I'm the owner of this place. And you hear those sirens. They're not going to a fire. They're coming for you. So with that said, why don't you leave and get out of here? I got to take this girl to the hospital. Because she, I mean, we all got cut ourselves shaving men or women. We know how I believe. Imagine, thank God he missed her eye. She had a full circle around her face, on her face. Amazing. So he said, no, mom. I said, what do you mean, no, mom? And with that, I didn't know he still had the bottle. So he goes to my juggler. I, I moved back, and I got 81 stitches along here. And fortunately, and I say fortunately, I, I had to just, I mean, I, I didn't know what to do with this guy. So I said to him, this is a Sea Island cotton shirt. I waited six months for the shirt. Look what you did to my shirt. I just wanted to divert him for a minute. Now he's looking at me like saying, is this guy for real? So I draw my gun and I put it to his forehead. I gave him one more shot. I said, listen, leave. I don't want any problems with you. Get out of here. He's F you. I said, really? So I put two right between his eyes. 150 people in my joint. Oh, look at him. You can hear a pin drop. The guy goes like this. Like he got bit by a mosquito. I found out later he, from the coroner, he was so loaded with coke. You know, that's why you don't shoot anybody in the head. You shoot behind the neck. And plus, I wanted a bigger caliber gun. There was only 25 gay. And I said, you know, I'm getting a 38 from that one. Forget it. Then I put the other three in his heart, only to find out he was Pablo Escobar's underboss, Lorenzo Morales. And that created a whole other thing for me. But, you know. So did I, Pablo seem like a psychopath or did he strike you okay. as a very intelligent man who simply... Very, when I got to meet him afterwards, I met him first at church, which I felt good at. I went to see John Gotti because I figured, well, how am I going to get in there? I knew he was dealing with Noriega and different people. And he, John, John was like a Jimmy Kahn. He couldn't wait for something that happened to me. So I go to see John. And I said, John, I got to get into to, to, uh, Bogota. And it was already over the news, everything. This is now I'm, I fly in to meet him on a Monday morning. And, oh, and he's teasing me. Oh, now you're a killer. Now you're not an actor. I said, I'm not a killer. He's well, you killed a major guy. I said, well, this is why I'm here. I said, I got to go see him. He said, you're going to fly into Colombia. I said, yeah. Because I found out he was a Marielito. And he didn't even know what that was. I said, he's going to kill my neighbors, my dogs, my kids before me. They want me to suffer. I said, I can't have that happen. He said, so you're going to go there. He said, I'm going to try myself in. And I did. Because I already had, that time I had seven kids. Now I got 11. I had seven already then. So I flew there. I met him in the church, and the church was empty. And I'm saying, wait a minute. And there was a guy way up in the altar on the right-hand side. And I figured that was him. As I got walked closer, as I walked down the pew, down the aisle, the pew started creaking, and all his guys sat up as I passed them with guns. And when I got to the altar, he said to me, are you Johnny Russo? I said, yeah. And that's all I remember. <laughs> Somebody hit me in the back of the head, and I woke up three stories below the house he built for his own prison. And there were body bags all over me, and the, and the, around me, and the stench was ridiculous. And these guys were having their way with me. I don't even know how long. And I was shackled to a chair. And uh, I don't know how many day, hours or days, and he showed up. I didn't know it was him, but he was dressed very neatly. And I was sitting in the chair, and I looked up, and I'm, I thought I was hallucinating. And he had the book, The Making of the Godfather, in his hand. And, I, and he said to me, why didn't you tell me you were Carlo from the Godfather? 
That's my favorite movie. <laughs> Just clean them up and bring them up to the house. Hours later, I'm in the house. Well clean. They give me medicine. And uh, I'm sitting at a dining room table talking to the guy. And he said, why did you come here? I said, well, I did my homework. You have a daughter the same age as my daughter, Gia. What would you do if you were told somebody's going to kill her? I have to come and tell you my story. He said, I know your story. I said, I don't know if you do. And I told him the story, and he didn't. John Gotti gave him another story, like I was going to try to take over this guy's territory. I wouldn't do nothing. So at the end of the story, he got up. And he walked over to me, he said, stand up, and he gave me a hug. He said, you're 200% a man. To come down here, I said, well, I, you know, I was hoping you'd feel that way, but I figured if you kill me, it's, it's over. Then, then my kids ain't going to get hurt. He says, you can go, but you got to do me a favor first. I said, whatever you want me to do, what do you want me to do? Wash your car, cut the grass. I was teasing him, now, now I'm his friend. You know, I want to do the closing scene of The Godfather. I said, are you kidding me? He said, no, I want to do it. I said, you want me to write the lines down? He said, no, no, I know the lines. Okay. So now I'm starting to think, this guy, this is how he's going to kill me. He is a true psychopath. Then he gets up to the door with a couple of guys. And he said, you sit over here like I was in my apartment on the phone. I sat there. And he came in. And he says, call up. <clears throat> You got to answer for Santini. And I'm doing my scene. It's please, Mike, I got it all wrong. No, Carlo, you think this far she played out with my sister could fool or call He's doing all the lines. I'm saying, oh man, this guy's nuts. At the end of it, we walk out like we're going to go to the car. He gives me an airline ticket. <laughs> I get to the car. I sit in the front seat and not only was there a Clemenza in the back seat, there was another guy. As soon as I sit in there, they all say, hello, Carlo. And they bust out laughing. He gives me a kiss. He's get out of here. I'll take care of this. And that was it. That scene alone is movie worthy. That's uh -huh. a movie in and of itself. Yeah. That's why, you know, when, when they dissected it and, and went through it, that they think we're going to be on television forever. Because of the stories they still have, you know. Like I said, I have 93 hours of podcast on top of these six. So I mean, if the ratings and the people like it, I, I mean, I have some fun with it. Yeah. I mean, just hearing you tell the story is very compelling. I could just imagine if it was set to film. So uh, how would you compare the sophistication and talent of somebody like Pablo Escobar uh, to somebody like Frank Costello? How would you compare these two men? You no, know, Costello was always soft, nonviolent. When the violence came, nobody would, you wouldn't share it. You'd, you'd be a dead. The, the, the people that groomed me, then they're, they're no longer around. This whole new group. And uh, I mean, I, I know them. I respect them because of who they are. I don't want to bother with them. I don't go meet people. I don't do anything like that. But when you, when you go, I went from a Costello and Carlo Gambino, to Tony Accardo, to Nick Savella, to Carlos Marcellus. These guys were real guys. They all died in their beds of natural causes. And they amassed millions and millions and millions of dollars. Look at Maya. I mean, it's, it's funny. And, yeah, but uh, isn't that, they're not these, you know, basically loudmouth blowhards. Look at me, I'm in the mafia. You know, it, it's a secret organization, which it has become again now. When, the, when, when, when a mob boss dies, what happens to his fortune? Is it absorbed by the organization or passed on to his family? What happens to a boss's money? A boss's money in the family goes to the family, not his family. See, when you, give, when you become a boss, you give up your family. Your oath is your, you give up your family. Okay. So... If he hasn't taken care of you already, they may give you something, but they don't have to. But the, the rules are when you take that oath, this is your only family. Hmm. That's why some brothers are challenged to kill their own brothers out of loyalty. And it almost happened with, 
with with the Bellottis. When Tommy was killed, Joey Bellotti was, uh, you know, a, a major guy, and they brought him in. Said, well, we, are we going to have a problem with you? We'll kill you right now. And uh, no, he made his oath, and his allegiance was to the Gambinos. You know, like Sammy DeBull ran the company. I know a, a lot of guys. He, he had over $3 million on the streets of Mount Sharking. Mm-hmm. Are you going to give that to his, his daughter or, or his son, Junior? And, and that kid, I don't know how they, I mean, John broke every rule in the world. John's, uh, John Jr.'s mother's Jewish. He can't be made. He made him. He made him, which is insane. <laughs> he broke all the rules at the end. How much larger do you think the mob would have become if they had decided to let all their people get involved in, in the drug trafficking business? Oh, my God. Well, they got involved anyway. Eventually, they all were. Right. They just didn't want to know about it. No, that, I think that the, what happened, my, my opinion, is once Howard Hughes made a deal with the American government and he got that last big military contract, most of that money had to be spent on buying hotels. They had to go into private business and they weren't allowed to at that time, meaning the FBI, CIA, all of that. And that's why if you look at, and that may be another book I may write, if you look at when Howard Hughes started buying up Vegas, they have Bill Dana, Bob Mayhew. These are all ex-CII guys. That's who you, they were. Do you, by the way, did you ever meet Howard Hughes? Oh, yeah. I used to walk with him. Do you think that's where his, his power came from, the backing of the CIA, or was it just his own business brilliance? Oh, his business brilliance. Well, he, he was I mean, he was aircraft, studios. I mean, he was a brilliant, brilliant guy. But they needed a guy like that for the world to understand that he could do this. And that's what he did. But, you know, that, they hooked him on heroin. You know, he was a clean freak. And he, he was the, basically, he had a, a, an IV bag all the time he was sleeping. But they didn't realize, he didn't realize what they were doing to him. Hmm. They took control of him. Yeah, I left in the middle of the night and took it to Texas. Huh. So uh, I heard uh, that you've been shot three times and stabbed twice. Most people would change careers after the first gunshot. And they, you know, they don't put up a 7 11. What's that? You forgot me being run over. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I mean, most people would do a serious career change immediately after getting out of the hospital. Was the money and the power just so addictive that you decided to ride it out? Or, or what, what was going on there? How do you persist after all those attempts? But, you know, probably if it happened early on when I just started. But, you know, it, just, it was very vengeful. These, these all happened in my 20s and 30s. And I just took care of it myself. I ain't going to give up my business. That's what they were trying to do. They were trying to scare me to leave my business. I just fortified myself and went after them. The last guy I was, I mean, the last guy who shot at me was Frank Collada. And he, and he killed one of my guys right in my arms and in Vegas. But you no, know, they were trying to take, they wanted slot machines in my joint. They were trying to muscle me and scare me. I don't get scared. I get angrier. And I get, you know, I, I, I get stronger people to go after you. Yeah. When a guy tries to kill you, and fails. You know, they say if you're going to strike the king, you cannot right. miss. But a guy, when a guy tries to kill you and fails, does he usually skip town? Does he does he go back and hire more men? Okay, what well, usually happens? Well, what I do is I, I want I go through protocol. I want to know who he's around, why he did that, and let them know I'm coming after him. And maybe they can turn him over to me. Maybe they do, or maybe they don't. See, the other thing I can't talk about, there's no statues on people disappearing. Right, right, right. You know, I, I, I've been in front of a judge three times for those things, and I won each time. Okay. And he said the funniest thing to me. He said, the next time you come in here for an offense like this, you better open up your shirt and you have a big S on it because you're going to jail. <laughs> I'm not a violent guy. It's, you know, people pick on me or try to. I ain't giving up anything I want to give you. Yeah. So there are countless rumors about the conspiracy theories uh, about the the assassination of JFK. 
But you know the real story. Is that something you can talk about? Of course. I wrote about it. I'll talk about it. No, I mean, Joe, Joe Kennedy made the deal. And they were supposed to invade and get the casinos back. The mob went nuts. I actually thought they were going to take Bobby down because Bobby was harassing them already. He, he initiated a law that was on the books and nobody ever used it called the RICO Act. Years ago, these guys would go to jail and do 10 years on their head. Like I said, I could do 10 years on my head because they had all their money. With the RICO Act, it was on the books, but nobody used it. And that was because of J. Edgar Hoover. But the RICO Act, once you got arrested and they'd come and see your wife next week and said, this house is in your name. Where'd you get the money for it? That was it. You're out. Damn. And they kept throwing people out. That's why so many people became rats. Because they made them deals saying, you can get a lighter sentence. You can keep so many assets. That's how, that's how they overturned the whole mob. Because of that. But, um, you know, when, when I was the second go around, you know, the first go around from 57 to 60, those three years, that's all I was doing was meeting, you know, major people in the industry and everywhere from uh, Lou Wasserman, you name them, to, uh, you know, uh, Alan Dorfman, major business people and mob people to back Senator John F. Kennedy, a Catholic boy, Democrat. And it worked. Now, a year and a half goes by, two years go by. Now we're at Cal Neva trying to convince Marilyn to take pictures with him. And then we all know the result of that. You know, she died. And then the next year, John, I thought it was going to be, I knew they were setting something up. It was just huge. But uh, never thought it would be John. But they wanted to go down because they're, they're strange. They met with John so many times, as I, as I did. You know, we, I used to party with him and Sinatra and all of them at Jack and Trotter's pool, pool house at, on the grounds of the Sands Hotel when he was still Senator John F. Kennedy. And they were grooming the guy. And, uh, but I thought being that Bobby created it all, and they, they, they couldn't get to, to Castro. Castro laughed them off. So with that said... That was it. And that's why Joe had the stroke. Because Costello told him, we're coming after your sons. Either you do it now, find a way to get rid of Castro. They gave him 30 days. He had a stroke. You know, you've been involved with the casinos for many years. Um, and, years. The, and the <laughs> pandemic has emptied out many of the casinos in oh Vegas God, now. Yeah. Almost no tourists, no gamblers are going there. I'm hearing that in the next six months, there will be 25 states that will legally allow sports betting online. Now, you're really well connected in this world. Do you think they'll be able to turn things around? Will the casinos start rolling out more aggressive nationwide online gambling in order to, uh, to react to the new economy? Where do you, th what? because now I'm hearing they're going to extend the lockdown for at least another year, possibly a year and a half. What do you think Vegas is going to do? I don't know if Vegas is going to survive, but I, that's funny you should say that because I just turned my book into a musical. And Tom Cantone is a very good friend of mine. In fact, he hired me to open Trump Marina in 1995. And now he's the head of entertainment for all of the uh, Mohegan Suns, which control eight casinos now and will have 12 casinos by the end of next year. So to put... Your, the myth you're hearing to, to sleep. They're building a billion dollar hotel in Greece right now as we speak. I have a contract with all of them. On March 7th, I took my mu first musical I ever wrote, my book, to Mohegan, uh, to uh, uh, Falls View Casino in Niagara Falls, had 1,500 people, had a two and a half minutes standing ovation. My next date was Resorts International, and they closed everything down. But I talk to them all the time. There is no way they're going away. Vegas is another story, because there's so many properties. See, the way these are scattered, there's enough to feed from. Vegas, there's a, a totally different situation, because number one, what attracted people to Vegas were the big acts. 
and the 1,500 people, 2,000 people in the seating. That's not going to happen for a long time. But I'm, I'm, I'm going. I'll, make, I'll tell you where I'm going. They're booking me right now, Fred Burroughs and Pela, which is a, a spa resort in San Diego. I'll be there in April. They're building a roof for me. You know, this next question is of great interest to me because uh, for a number of reasons. You mentioned recently that you believe Trump was still going to be in office for the next four years. Given all that's happened in the last week with regards to the Supreme Court decisions ruling against him, do you believe Trump is still going to be in office for the next four years? The only reason I don't now, I don't know what happened. I think the mistake was Giuliani, but I know Skinny Nicky and I, I know all these guys that, you know, were involved, especially with Pennsylvania and all those votes. I don't know why they're saying there's no proof. Mm. And everybody that even, you know, bear, everybody that's in his, now they're all, they're, they're flipping out. Mm. I thought for sure, because that's one thing I know about Trump, and I know him since I said 95. He really, uh, I mean, obviously he should have went to charm school, and but uh, his way of business I think was good for America. He, he gained our respect back from other countries. I fly all over the world. And, you know, during the Obama administration, I'm still worrying about that fiasco in Tyron. I wish I knew that plane was going there. We never got there. <laughs> How do you move that many billions of dollars in cash? Tons that, and tons and tons. I know, but I mean, geez, we, I could have... I, I, I worked it out with some people and they said that would have worked actually. Mm. We would have just took it down with like six fighter jets that we have control over offshore and the pilots would have took it. We would have took it someplace else and just let them know they changed the location. See you later. That kind of money. <laughs> so now I'm going to, now, now I'm going to ask you some financial questions about the world of organized crime. And if you don't know the answer or you don't want to answer it or, or you just okay. want to estimate, feel free. Yeah. Um, of all the mobsters and the made guys you have known throughout your life, what percentage of them do you think died broke? And what percentage of them do you think became rich? I don't think any of them died broke. Okay. I mean, mass fortunes. No, I mean, they went as, as time went on, as we all know, I mean, what they control, I mean, the, the new, the new word is, is uh, you know, uh, an investment bank or a hedge fund guy. And that, they, they now control these places. I mean, and uh, a lot of them are, are licensed and then using their money and their powers to buy up companies. And, you know, I, I, I have four companies that are going crazy right now. They're all legitimate companies. Did they start with legitimate money? Probably not. But you know, it's uh, I, I. You know, I'm I'm dealing with a guy who I'm, I'm fascinated with. You know, Jack Ma. This guy, what he did with Alibaba, and what he's doing now with us is. I mean, you know, even Putin. You know, I got to know Putin. I think the guy's a genius, and uh, but you know, the power they have. The, the difference is these guys made it. Our guys, like the Obamas, and they became presidents to become rich. Look at the money they went into the White House with, and look what they're worth when they leave. They didn't make that on $250,000 salaries. They made inside trading deals. Even by, by Joe Biden's kid. I mean, what, what do they need? to? It's so strange to me, you know. It's... Uh, and they tell me I'm crooked. <laughs> well, after the show, I'll tell you something that I heard about, about Ma, uh, but I, I don't want to say it on, on the air. So right, right. I'll tell you. Um, of all the organized crime groups out there now, the Italian mob, the Colombians, Chinese, mafia, Mexican cartels, which group do you think makes the most money each year and which group is the most powerful? I, I couldn't tell you, actually, because I only know the people I deal with. But I mean, I heard the Chinese are not going anywhere, and uh, there's some people out there, major, major. But I mean, you, I mean, look at the Mexican cartels; they're doing 10, 15 billion a month in drugs. And what's what's you know, 
who knows how much money is out there? It's crazy. Next question. What does it cost to bribe a judge, a senator, or a mayor these days? What is your guess? I don't know. I think they're all for sale, though. <laughs> I guess what, what, what are the value is. It's always good if you had something on them from their past. But, you know, when you're talking about, well, I'll, I'll give you a for instance, that's a fact that didn't work. When they had uh, Chopper Guzman here in uh, MCC, he, he offered the guards a million dollars each. And if he, they got him out, 10 million cash. And if they could get 10 guys to do it, but they didn't go for it. But now you take Epstein and he kills himself in the same prison. Mm. It's insane. It's something wrong. Yeah. So in the movie Scarface, Tony Montana talks to his lawyer about bribing a Supreme Court judge. Do you think that's possible? No. Do you think it's ever happened? I, I don't know, but I mean, to me, I, I wouldn't even, just to me, I don't go near law enforcement people, judges and all that. Yeah. To me, they're already above the law. You know, the thing that somebody told me a long time ago, if you're dealing with people that can call a cop, you may get arrested. Think about what I just said. Yeah. <laughs> I've never been arrested. Never had handcuffs on. Yeah. Uh, with people that can't call police. Yeah. What do you think it costs to arrange a presidential pardon? I don't know. That's an interesting question. And in today's market, I'm sure that's for sale. I'm sure it's for sale. But, but one thing I don't know about them, can they be reversed? I don't think so. Wow, that's wild. Uh, yeah, that... It, it, I, I know that, that I strongly suspect that money changes hands because I look at the people who are getting pardoned. You know, there are instances where I suspect no money changed hands, but, uh, you know. But anyways, uh, when it comes to your life, what was more interesting? The incredible things that you've told us about or the things that you cannot reveal? The stuff I didn't tell you about. <laughs> hmm. no, I mean, you know, I, I've had an interesting life. I met and... and you know, hindsight is twenty twenty, but did I know while I was doing these things I was going to get away with it? I, I, I always put enough money away. I, I, I'm not a stupid person. I have no bad habits. I mean, I have two martinis a night. I don't do drugs. I don't gamble. I never did. And I make smart investments because I never know when it's going to stop. And I've watched a lot of it stop. I mean, I've changed careers so many times that People don't even know what I do. But, uh, you know, you got to be diversified, fortunately, and I am. And uh, I have an army of young gentlemen. I have nine sons and 10 grandsons and two daughters. So what I'm doing now is not even for me. It's, it's five, five generations down the road. <laughs> Who has 19 boys so far? And I don't know how many I'm going to have. It's crazy. Probably your greatest investment that you'll ever make. Oh, it is. And it has been, it's paid off already, dearly for all of them. It's, it's nice to see kids that don't have to struggle and don't have to do the things I did. And it's a different world now. I would never survive in this world. The cameras alone, I'd be arrested two blocks away. It's, uh, you can't do anything. I don't jaywalk. Yeah. You know, in ancient Rome... They say that 30 out of 33 emperors or Caesars were assassinated. In Russia, they had a meeting of 45 billionaire oligarchs a few years, a few years back. Five years after that meeting, I'm told that 40 of those 45 men have been killed or died under suspicious circumstances. More recently, it seems that mob bosses and cartel leaders are getting killed and imprisoned at an extremely high rate. It seems to me that a lot of these deaths and prison sentences could have been avoided if these people put more money and more technology into their efforts to keep their identities and their work secret. Do, do you get the impression that that's as high a priority as it should be? Or is it a handshake and a wink and everything will be okay? What, what, what are your thoughts? Well, I'm, I'm, I'm like you. I, I, 
I'm in the tech world now. I mean, I, I fortunately have so many things going on that I wouldn't even tell anybody what I'm doing at this point because it's too sophisticated. Mm. And it's, you're, whatever it is, who are you telling it to? And uh, I think that, the, the, I mean, the, the group of people you just spoke to, you left one group out that totally confuses me. I think it's like 63 of the Clinton friends committed suicide. Hmm. Who has 63 friends that I know of another group that nobody's even in investigating it? And if that's the case with friends, imagine what happens to the enemies. Hello. Well, I'm saying friends, but they're associates, I should say. Hmm. But 63 people have committed suicide. So, the- so, so Gianni, you don't have any felony convictions at all, which is just amazing. Um, uh, I don't know if that's strength of character or your incredible IQ or the universe helping you out, but it's an amazing accomplishment. I think not even John Gotti had that kind of luck. No, no, none of them did. Yeah. <laughs> that's why I, I went to a birthday party, and I, I could say his name now because he just died. Nicky Generoso, he, he died at 98 years of age, and he was the true street boss yet of the Genovese family. And he has sons and bosses and all that. And I always promised I'd show because I respect the guy and I have nothing to do with him. And anytime I go to this party, I mean, this party is like a scene in a movie. They tell you where the party is an hour before. Mm -hmm. When you get there, another car comes and takes you where the real party is. But you have to leave your cell phone in the car you came in (laughs) and we'd go. I just love the intrigue, but every year it would get less and less people there. And every time I walked in, the biggest compliment he thinks he can give me, which was an insult to all the other people there, I never knew if I'd get out of there. He'd say, this is the only guy I know, smarter than all you jerks. He's never been in jail, never been arrested. <laughs> and I'd say, Nicky, please don't say that again. And his kids wanted to kill me. <laughs> Well, you're a Sagittarius, correct? Yeah. Every Sagittarian I have ever known has been extremely bright. So perhaps that's part of it. I don't know. Well, whatever it is, I thank God or whoever my supreme being is. And I believe in God. But to me, I am so blessed. I'm thankful for it. I'm, I give back. And uh, I always say, be a gentleman. Yeah. Don't get mad at you if you're a gentleman. Yeah. So... You know, I mentioned the fact that you have never had any felony convictions because technically that means you could run for office. And if you were to run for a major office, what would be some of the laws that you would change immediately? I would never run for anything. Yeah. An office, I, I, I hate offices anyway. I don't go to them. I get up at 12 o'clock every day. I don't want to, I don't want to tell anybody what to do. And I, I, a politicians today are not the politicians we knew of. Our forefathers, I think, were really someone taking an office for the true reason. I think everybody, as we've seen in the last 10, 15, 20 years, went to glorify themselves. They all became multimillionaires. How does that happen? (laughs) You know what's really ironic about that answer you just gave is that they say that the only people who should ever run for office are those who would never want to run for office. So your answer was really sort of perfect. But um, if you were to go back now and talk to young 20-year-old Johnny Russo, what advice would you give him? Tell him to go to school like I do with all my kids. Mm-hmm. And it's, it's a harder world now. You know, to, to achieve what I have achieved, or even a portion of it, every, every field is so saturated especially now with the unemployment the way it is. So you really should excel in anything you really want to do. Get to know the product, get to know who you are, get to know how to get to where you want to go. And don't overdream because it's not going to happen. And save your money. So you've written an incredible book called Hollywood Godfather, My Life in Movies and the Mob. And the stories you've told today are just some of the stories in that book. Um, what do you want people to know about that book? Because it really is amazing. Well, the, the last sense of the book is, is the true reality. I waited till I was 75 
there were certain statues I had to wait for. And for a couple of guys to die, too. And a couple of them I mentioned tonight, Fortune Jr. passed away now. And Frank Collada got COVID. But, you know, to, to me, it's the last paragraph of that book is all about who I am. I have uh, two, two children, my last two children, and my last wife, who basically was totally justifiable in getting a restraining order on me worldwide because she was in, in danger. Of, of, our kids were in danger because of my lifestyle. And she proved it to a court. And I felt, you know, I gave Luciano and, and Adriana the love. I drove them to school every day, was there. I really turned my life around. I was producing television shows. People can't believe I, I produced one of the most famous kid shows ever called AJ's Time Travelers for Fox Network. And I always thought, you know, I believe in God, and I still do. And I say in the book, hopefully someday I'll get those kids back. And that's what it's about. We all, we all have a hurt. Yes, I had a great life and still do. You know, I'm sitting in Frank Costello's apartment, 2,200 square foot, which was a gift. <laughs> it's like, you, know, you know, you're doing a lot of appearances now, and, and, and hopefully uh, uh, these children will see some of these yeah. uh, appearances and they'll take what you say to heart and maybe they will reconnect. I'm hoping so. Yeah, I think that would be amazing. So before we wrap this up, is there anything else you would like to promote? No, well, I'm, I, you know, I'm the brand ambassador to something I'm really proud of that I'm involved with. It's the Corleone Fine Family of Foods. Well, we're not foods no more. They changed it because we have so many products. We're in liquor and everything else. But the quality of our stuff is what I'm proud of. It's, you know, the, the Genko olive oil, the tomato sauces, everything. And it's, if you go online, it's Corleone Fine Italian now. That's because it encompasses so much. And then what else I'm doing that I'm really proud of during this nine months of pandemic, all these clothes, everybody complimenting my shirts. I actually designed all of this. So I have a, a, a company that I'm launching for my kids. And you're going to love the name of this, John. La Cosa Mia by Gianni. It's nice. my thing. <laughs> nice, nice, nice. Uh, so, Johnny, I want to thank you for appearing on the John Ark Show. Uh, I want to wish you all the best. And I suspect that your luck will carry you forward to, to even further and greater success. I thank you, for, first of all, for allowing me. And, um, and again, to all your audiences, have a great holiday. Be happy and smile. And wear a mask, I guess. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. I want to thank our viewers for watching and tell you that uh, we're going to have more great celebrity interviews coming up and more breaking news stories uh, in the future. So we want to encourage you to subscribe to our channel, click on the notification bell. Uh, that's really important. By doing that, you'll be notified every time we upload a new episode. Thank you for watching and we will see you soon.